Let us now begin with the next panel discussion of the day. The topic of discussion is providing support for ADHD, dyslexia, and other learning disorders without overwhelming the classroom environment. Kindly note, the panel discussion floor would be open for question answer session later. May I take this opportunity to introduce the panelists to you? Dr. Manila Carvalho, founder principal, Delhi Public School, Bangalore East. She needs no introduction. She has an experience of over 30 years as an educationist. She is a PhD scholar whose thesis was titled on the effect of academic adjustment and parental pressure on mental health of senior secondary students. She has been featured on many regional TV channels as an educationist, a woman achiever, and has contributed articles to various journals and newspapers, and has published papers in reputed journals. She is a recipient of several state, national, and international awards. Ma'am, may I welcome you onto the stage with a big round of applause. Our next panelist is Ms. Harshita Kumar, Dean, National Public School, J.P. Nagar, and National Public School, Varthur. A talented educationist, Ms. Kumar is skilled in teaching, learning, school management, and has been a vital part of the National Public School team. May I take this opportunity to welcome you, ma'am, onto the stage. Next on our panel, we have Mrs. Preeti Bhandari, Co-Founder and Curriculum Director, Learning Edge India Private Limited, Little Ellie. Ms. Preeti is a veteran educationist and an entrepreneur. She has over 18 years of experience in early childhood education and care. Her views on working with young minds are radical, progressive, and dynamic. She considers each child as an individual. She is passionate about unearthing and cultivating a child's potential through creative, stimulating and exclusive channels. She has spent a large part of her career evolving unrivaled curriculums to foster the individual needs of a child to mold a child into an exclusive person. May I request Ms. Preeti Bhandari to join us on stage. May I request all our panelists till now to join us on stage, please. Next in our panel, we have Mr. Jay Prakash, CEO, St. George Education Society, Paul George Global School. Mr. Jay Prakash is an accomplished educator, highly motivated, intuitive, and result-focused professional, having worked as a principal, CEO, and director of CBSE K-12 schools and group of schools for more than three decades. He's a patient listener and a great communicator. Welcome, sir, onto the stage. Last but not the least, Ms. Anuradha Ramesh, Principal, NPS Agara. Ms. Anuradha Ramesh has over 30 years of experience in the field of education. She is a stellar educator with experience in teaching, school leadership roles, school management, and much more. May I welcome you, ma'am, onto the stage. So ladies and gentlemen, this is our panel for the evening. May we have a big round of applause for all our panelists on the stage. And may I request Dr. Manila Carvalho to chair the panel. Yeah. Thank you so much and a warm welcome once again on behalf of this panel. And we will be discussing about creating an environment for the students who are diagnosed as ADHD, dyslexic, or any other disorders. And we do have the eminent panel members here who are doing extremely well in their respective schools with regard to these students. And today they are here to share their experiences, their suggestions, their guidance. And um, I would like to um, request the panelists to introduce themselves, just your name, your designation, and your passion. I'm Jay Prakash, a teacher by choice and a CEO by accident. Thank you. Welcome, sir. I'm Anuradha Ramesh. I'm very passionate about teacher training. 
I'm Harshita Kumar, Dean, National Public School, J.P. Nagar, and Varthor. My aim is to make sure quality education is available at any cost to every student. Good evening, everyone. I am Preeti Bhandari. Uh, I you know, identify myself as a mom of two beautiful girls first. I am a teacher by heart and a trainer. And uh, finally, I have uh, I become the founder of Little Ellie Preschools and Glentry Academy, which is a K-12 CBSE school. Warm welcome again. And uh, my first question goes to Mr. Jay Prakash. How do we create an environment for the students who have diagnosed with ADHD and uh, dyslexic or any other disorder without overwhelming the classroom? I think uh, this question is very relevant because most of our classrooms are 40 students each, if not more. And in that environment, if we have to cater and we have, we have to be seriously inclusive in nature, we have to have certain things in place for sure. One is surely the differentiated instructions, because uh, the, all the teaching methods, I mean, our teaching methods should be tailor-made in a way that caters to the needs of different learning styles, the students of different learning styles. That is the primary thing. Then communication has to be very clear. When I say clear, not elaborate. Precise, concise, easy to understand, because more the information, more time it takes to process, and then in the process we lose out on many details. Structured environment, when I say structured environment, the routines and the expectations should be very clearly laid out, and time and again reiterated. Flexible seating, especially for the uh, sensory needs of the ADHD students. The seating arrangement should be, because most of us have fixed learning. We, ha we keep that only in the junior classes. In the, as the students move ahead, or, or, or to the higher classes, we have a fixed seating. That actually, you know, the, these students are restless. They need to move around. That movement and break times also are very important. So if it is flexible seating, they get a, a, a novelty to the classroom, not any monotony will stri strike them. Assistive technology should be used, especially in case of dyslexic students. When it comes to text to speech and speech to text, it's very important. And. Uh, Peer support and collaboration, all said and done with many teachers around, we still see that most of the students study well or, or do well in the company of their peers when they study from each other, when they take help from each other. So that space has to be given to them. As I said, breaks and movements, very important. Uh, parental involvement, without that, we cannot go a single step forward. Last but not at all least is the prof professional development programs of the teachers. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be one-off thing that one in once in a year or twice in a year. It has to be continuous, day after day. Teachers learning from their peers, how they are managing the particular section of students better than the others. And then learning, and that training has to happen as a routine, as a way of life throughout the year. Rightly said, yes. The environment that we create in the classroom for the free, free movement of the students matters a lot. And over to you, Madam Anuradha. What are the strategies we can implement in the classroom? Because whenever we identify uh, ADHD children, it is very difficult to communicate with the parents because parents do not accept the reality. It is very difficult. Initial uh, days, you know, principal or the teacher find it very difficult to convince the parents. So may I request you some of the strategies where we can identify children with ADHD, dyslexic, or any other disorders that are present? Uh, I think we should first uh, educate our teachers, or create awareness in our teachers to be very vigilant and observant in the class to find out students with uh, learning disorders. Mm -hmm. That is very important. To establish a uh, good teacher-parent uh, communication is again important because like, like you said, ma'am, generally they don't accept really? when we suggest sending the child to the counselor or it really requires convincing abilities on our part to make them realize, understand that there is an issue and intervention is required there, then probably we can have an individual uh, student plan, education plan that is called the IEP, uh, which can be, which can actually uh, provide individual plans to students at, according to their requirement, setting clear goals, 
probably a structured environment for the students in the classroom also will help because when you have a structured environment and set da daily clear routines to the children, they, are, they know that this is what they have to do and this is what is expected from them. So probably that would help the children with learning disorders. And like uh, Mr. Jai Prakash already said, assistive technology like speech to text and text to speech would help. Probably differentiated instruction also could help wherein we can in, uh, integrate different learning styles in the classroom and engage every student into the content that is available. So that could probably help them. And of course, peer-assisted learning is one very good strategy which can be implemented um, for the children. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, expressing various strategies to help out these children in the classroom. A lot of technology has got into education. And my question goes to Ms. Preeti. In what ways technology is to be leveraged to provide personalized support to the children to help out in learning outcome in them? Yeah. Uh, see, we all are aware that technology has played a major role. In fact, uh, during the pandemic, we all realized as educators how technology can help us reach out to children during that crisis, right? And when it comes to the children with learning disorders, uh, it, technology has really helped. And there are so many ways that we can make use of the technology. Like Mr. Jay Prakash said that, you know, uh, there are certain um, tools like SST, uh, sorry, STT and TTS, you know. We can use those, especially for the visually impaired children. That is very helpful. Moreover, even the infrastructure, the resources that we have and the tools that we have, our teachers should be able to use it rightly. You know, so our teachers need training on that. Definitely, there's a lot of training required on these aspects. Teachers need to be aware, and most importantly, teachers should know that they have to be one step ahead when it comes to technology, so that they can teach the future generation. So having said that, I feel that uh, even uh, when we have ch students of ADHD and autistic children, we can use hybrid learning, because that time, the special educator can enter through virtual classes and the parent also comes to know, you know, how my child is behaving. Because when the child comes to school, parent most of the time is unaware of what is happening. So this way the parent also gets a chance to be a part of it. Finally, it is communication which will help between all the three stakeholders, parents, teachers and the child. So that is very important. So I feel communication has to be done right and a very personalized uh, attempt has to be made by every teacher to handle the children. Thank you, Ms. Preeti. Of course, since morning, we had a lot of presentation by various technology teams on screen here to show how technology plays a very important role and how to draw attention of the students in class. I think you reach out to the stalls there and uh, they'll be a great resource for us in our school. And my next question goes to Ms. Harshita. We speak about teacher training. Teacher training plays a very, very important role. Generally, we say, I have done my BA about 10, 12 years back. But the same method of teaching, same style of teaching, if I implement in the school, for the current generation of students is up the waste. So I need to change with the time, with the generation. And here I'm asking you a question. How can a teacher training programs better prepare the educators to understand and accommodate this diverse learning group of students? Thank you, ma'am. For the question, my point is that all these years teachers were very accustomed to the normal teaching style, and a child who is suffering with a learning disorder usually be termed as a low performer, and there was some sort of ignorance being exhibited towards the child. And now, it is very important to make the teacher believe that every single child can be treated equally and taught in the school without any difference. By instilling the belief, the first step is taken towards inclusive education. They will, in fact, help in creating a very, uh, what do you say, environment which is more conclusive for the child, very welcoming. That solves the major problem of opening up those young minds. They believe that even they can study, 
they start opening up to their peer group. By training the teachers with different learning styles, they'll be aware of it. They can make changes to their teaching patterns and make sure the child feels comfortable. And most important is the teacher will have to communicate with the parent. That is a very major problem. By training a particular teacher and making her aware of the different ways of handling the child, probably they can educate the parent. They can always say that the child might be facing a learning disorder, but that doesn't mean she's left out or he or she is left out from the group. There's ample number of ways to handle the child, take them out in the social gatherings. Eventually, by observation, they'll definitely learn why to leave them out. It is not their mistake. So that problem gets solved. And by teaching them or handling n number of training programs, they can tell the students, the peer group, which plays a major role. Students can't differentiate. They are very inclusive in their mind by birth. For example, I can just quote an example. In our school, there was a particular child. The child suffers from ADHD. And the child never, like, never want to open their mouth in front of the teacher. But the peer group knows the fact that the child is very active when the teacher is not in the classroom. So when the teacher enters the classroom or is in the classroom, the child just hesitates to answer. So they try to tell the uh, child or their friend saying that if a particular question is asked, if the once the teacher steps out, they're like, OK, okay, Ankit, you can start talking about it now. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. Very true. I truly agree with you because it is the teacher who plays a major role in the classroom. There are children who have hated the subject because of the teacher, children who have liked the subject because of the teacher. And if the teacher doesn't understand these children, I think in you know, a classroom environment is totally spoiled. However good you are with your subject knowledge or the content that you are teaching, if you do not have the humanitarian approach to every child, you are losing, as a, you know, having as a good teacher in the classroom. So I think each one of us play a very important role in touching the lives, touching the heart of the students. Parents do play a very, very important role in upbringing the children. It is the parent and the teacher. It's a joint venture, I must say, that uh, teaching learning process happens. I would like to throw a question to Mr. Jay Prakash. Um, what role do parents and caregivers play in supporting the education of students uh, with learning disorders and how collaboration between home and school strengthens it? See, it all starts with the parents' acceptance. What happens is that for the initial couple of years or maybe more, they're in the denial mode. Obviously because of, you know, uh, I, I read this line somewhere, sabse bada rog kya kehenge log. So they are, they are most troubled by this thought, ki, first of all, no, it cannot happen to me. Why me? It cannot happen to me. It cannot happen to my chi ch child. There is nobody in my family or extended family like this, but nobody knows it. It is said that 99% of us, all of us have some kind of learning disability or the other, it will be minor, but we don't know, right? Okay. So now we have the techniques, the tools, the people, the experts to tell us, yes, there is a difficulty somewhere. The earlier it is detected and accepted by the parent, the better it is for the child. Because then the, the concerted effort of the school and the, teach, uh, the parent and maybe an external help or an expert comes into play and then from there the child travels parallelly with the other students and some time in the future they come on the same main line and then no march ahead that happens yeah. communication both ways from school to home and home to school as well they should work as one unit you know uh, i had this feeling some time back that if the teach if the, if the teacher behaves like a parent at school and the parent behaves as someone like a teacher at home, issues will be sorted out. It will be very nice. I mean, it's easier said than done, but then there can be a mechanism in place. Uh, a devoted time for both parties to be in touch with each other, 
not making the spare, uh, students feel stressed about that these two are talking to each other about me. There can be a nice way of right. doing it, especially in today's time after COVID. What COVID has given us is that this, this you know, face-to-face uh, -face conversation sitting at home. Mm -hmm. You know, that can be a beautiful thing in the evening. One or two teachers can always, uh, 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 with the student in uh, at the party, talking to them, which we do in our schools now. Yeah, very, very and essential because communication with the parents is very, very right. important very and important. early identification really helps. It doesn't remain with the children as they grow older. I think early identification and uh, helping out the children, um, you know, uh, by creating individual learning plans for their out learning outcome is very, very essential in the classroom. May I request you, madam, any case studies in short, because we do not have much time, if you can just give us one case study from your school, which you have, you know, which very much closer to your heart, which you have helped the children out. I, I have a student in grade five, and uh, he's actually very intelligent, but the child has ADHD. And the school had to work. We have a whole school environment which caters to inclusive education. So there is a lot of awareness among the classmates as well that the child requires help. help. And all, all the classmates actually are willing to help the child. They are very empathetic to the child. Sometimes he, can, he could be very impulsive or his reactions are uh, not very conducive to a classroom environment, but still the children are ready to help him. At the same time, I have a good set of teachers who are aware about the problems and the intervention that is needed for this child and all of them pitch in and we see a lot of progress. We are monitoring the progress continuously with the child. The parents are in touch with the school and we have a student counselor and an educator whom I am in touch with. So regular progress is monitored, and I see a lot of change, positive change in the child. That's so nice. Thank you so much for sharing um, this information with us. And the question goes to Preeti, madam. We talk about a lot of policies, the national policies, the district policies. Could you suggest some of the policies that are there so that you know we are also aware of those policies to help out the children? Yeah, one important policy I think all the CBSC schools, uh, I don't know about the ICSC, is the um, you know, inclusive policy, where um, most of the time it is more for the children who are physically disabled. So there are certain compliances with the CBSC is very, uh, you know, they're very strict about that you should have ramps for the dis uh, disabled children to go in the wheelchair. Your uh, washroom doors have to be a specific uh, width so that the, you know, the wheelchair can go easily in. So these are certain uh, policies which are there in place. The only thing is how far we diligently follow it, you know. There is a teacher training, uh, uh, you know, mandate that happens, formal and informal. But in how many teacher trainings do, uh, you know, the teacher actually comes to know that she can identify children who have issues, who, are not, who have some learning disability or who have some shortcomings in their learning journey. So I feel policies such as this has to be made. Most importantly, even the parents. Parents are always, like Mr. Prakash said now, they are always in a denial mode first. Really? Rightly so, because none of us have a parenting degree here, right? We are all, one day we get a baby and we are all parents. So if you think from their perspective, you know, it's so difficult for a parent to actually accept. And many a times, I'm sure, all of you here will agree that they are always in a denial mode. So how do we convince them? So we need psychologists, we need special educators, we need counselors who can do the right thing, you know, who can give them the right advice and make them strong. They should not become weak. They have to become strong. Morally, somewhere even the whole society has to be aware because it's more of a community, right? So the parent, the child, the teacher, and the neighborhood, if they understand, how these children, how the children are, you know, can be handled. These kind of policies should fall in place. I'm sure in the days to come, I hope that it does fall in place. Yes, yes definitely. We need to help out these children. And I'm sure you're aware of National Institute of Open Schooling, which supports these children a lot. Children can study in the regular school. If they're not able to give all the five papers together, you can support these children to give one paper at a time through nas open schooling. So I think that one, please access that because we cannot deny education to any child 
and uh, some other boards, you know, we have to give all the papers together. But this board, NIOS, offers facility for the children to give one paper at a time, and they get nine attempts to clear one paper. Uh, so please do reach out to me in case you do not have idea about NIOS. I can help you out. But uh, we need to help out the children. And my last question to Harshita, madam. We talk about IEPs. How do teachers implement these IEPs in the classroom? IEP, uh, being a very systematic plan to handle the kids who are actually having some difficulty in learning, it is not a something which is out of the box. Probably the same techniques can be utilized for a slow learner. What the teachers can probably do is when they sit for planning the, for the lesson, they can always keep the IEP goals right next to them. They can make necessary changes in their lesson plan itself. Why especially for one particular child? You can always make a systematic plan for the whole class, or probably you can have a limited concept in a particular period. Have a number of visual aids. Like every student learns the best when there's a visual aid. Make your classroom so interactive that even the child who has facing a learning disorder, by looking at it at M number of times, basically repetition works for such children. So by looking at it, they'll end up learning the concept. So basically they have access to the equal amount of knowledge like the other students. And what you could probably do is you can follow the scaffolding uh, technique in while giving instructions. When the teacher herself is more organized in her way of teaching, it will help the child much better. And what you could probably do is, the teachers, it's a, it's a task to teach children with special disorders. So what you could probably do is, when they are inside the classroom, make the rules what you, uniform, so that whether you will be able to identify a child with a learning disorder or not, you will still be able to cater to their needs. And timing is very important for them. And you can probably have separate assessments, separate assignment sheets. Probably another child in the class might not know it, but you can always specialize the plans for that particular child. It, in fact, boosts the confidence of the child. Right, is it? So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I do not have much time because I'm go so going on showing me time's up. Do I have two minutes just to throw a question, take a question from the audience? Yes, thank you. So any question from the audience to the panelist? I can take only two, not more than that, quickly. Any questions to the panelists? No one? This one hand coming up the last. No? I think everybody has to catch the flight. That's what Sir says. Anyway, thank you so much for uh, patiently listening to us. And um, thank you for this special panelist here who shared their ideas, thought processes. Thank you for being the best panelist. Thank, thank you, so you much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, all the panelists. May I request you to please be on stage. May I request Mr. Anil Sharma to felicitate our guests. May I request Mr. Rohit Mittal to join us on stage, please?
Can we have a big round of applause for our panelists, ladies and gentlemen? Can we have Mr. Rohit Mittal on stage? <laughs> 